Black Family. Sadat here. Got the new segment from Professor Black Truth. It's 15 minutes, 18 seconds. Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the professor, and this is the moment of truth. You know, as the war in Israel happens to continue to drag on, there are more and more black folks who are thinking that maybe we ought to be saying something or doing something. Actually, we shouldn't. We don't have a dog in this fight. We need to be staying out of this conflict. We don't need to be taking any sides because we don't have any dog in this fight. We have no interests that are at stake either. Simply put, we do not get involved in third party disputes. Nobody fighting over there is aligned with us, so we're not getting involved. It has nothing to do with us. Though that hasn't stopped a lot of people, particularly in the white media, from trying to get us involved. I can understand why they would want to, though. The U.S. has no moral legitimacy. People in these foreign countries can't even pretend like the United States is even halfway honest. The U.S. is biased and corrupt and everybody knows it. And it's especially unfortunate that this happens to be going on in regards to a conflict in Israel. I told you about how it was black men who not only made sure that there was a state of Israel, but black men who also stopped Israel from being wiped out only moments after its birth. Back in 1948, when the UN was voting on whether or not to formally recognize Israel as a legitimate nation, there were African countries who refused to do so. President Truman knew that he couldn't send any pasty white guys to go talk to them. He needed somebody with credibility. So he sent Walter White, who was then president of the NAACP. And Walter White convinced those African countries to drop their objections, and Israel was finally recognized by the UN as a state. See, when people talk about the UN recognizing Israel as a state, that's the part of the story that gets left out, even by Israeli spokespeople and historians. They leave out that it was a black man who was crucial to getting Israel recognized by the UN. But even then, the fight wasn't over. No sooner than Walter White got the UN to recognize Israel as a state than the Arab countries in the region attacked. Israel didn't have a real army at this point. All they had was a few lightly armed militias and needless to say, they didn't have any nuclear weapons. They were overwhelmed. And this might have been the end of Israel, except that another black man, Ralph Bunch, was chosen by the UN General Secretary to broker a ceasefire and eventually an end to the conflict, which he did. There is no substitute for the moral legitimacy that black Americans represent, specifically those of us who came out of slavery in the US, even among other black groups from abroad. We are not just out for self or tied to any British monarchy or Francophiles or anything else. We are known and respected around the world as a group who stood up to the US government. So we're understood to be truly neutral. Nobody else can say that, not even black people from foreign countries. That's why people are trying to rope us into this. Because the last few times things went south, they needed us to fix the mess. And now we have people trying to make some false comparisons between the combatants over there and black Americans. There's a lot of things you can say about the Palestinians and the Israelis, but you can't compare either group to chattel slavery or the subjugation that we faced afterwards. Though that hasn't stopped the white media or various people in political circles from trying. No Israeli that I know of can go into Gaza or the West Bank and buy a Palestinian. No Palestinian family has ever been owned by an Israeli. There's no comparison. And likewise, no Palestinian has ever been able to lynch Israelis and think that the government was going to support them on that. There have never been any Jewish codes in Israel enforced by the Palestinians. So why is it then that we keep hearing about the history and the oppression of black people being brought up for some sort of false comparison with what's going on over there or with various acts that are going on over here? On MSNBC, you had a show where Nicole Wallace claimed that Jews are 2% of the population, but 60% of the hate crimes victims. Did you know yesterday the FBI director, Christopher Ray? talked about an extraordinary uptick and said that Jewish Americans make up 2.4 percent of the populations but represent I think about 60 percent of the number of victims of hate crimes. Do those statistics ring true to you in terms of the hate you feel on campus? Did you get that? She said that Christopher Ray, the FBI director, said that Jews are 60 percent of all hate crimes victims. Let me play that again so you hear it. Yesterday the FBI director Christopher Ray talked about an extraordinary uptick and said that Jewish Americans make up 2.4 percent of the populations, but represent, I think, about 60 percent of the number of victims of hate crimes. 
Now, what she said isn't true. Director Ray never said that. I know if the white media is talking, they're lying. So I decided to look up this quote Nicole Wallace was giving from Director Ray, saying that Jews are 60% of hate crimes victims. And as I thought, he didn't say that at all. What Ray said was that Jews are 60% of all religious-based hate crimes, which happens to be a small subset of hate crimes in general. Not 60% of hate crimes. 60% of all religious-based hate crimes. And that's only a recent development. That's a far cry from what Nicole Wallace claimed, now isn't it? Also, Chris Ray's exact quote was that Jews account for something like 60% of all religious-based crimes. He didn't say it is 60%. He said it was something like 60%. So he wasn't giving an exact figure. Though when it comes to hate crimes in the U.S., I can give you some exact figures, and they're from the FBI. But before anyone tries to claim that this was perhaps some innocent mistake on Nicole Wallace's part, just look at what she's doing while she was giving that erroneous information. She was looking down and reading off her notes when she said that. She wasn't just saying it off the top of her head. She's reading off of her notes. She's looking down and reading this. So it wasn't some accident. So either her notes were wrong, in which case someone at CNN is writing false copy and giving it to the anchors, or it meant that she saw what it said and just decided to say something else anyway. And this skewed reporting extends way beyond the current Israeli-Palestinian war. CNN just reported that anti-Asian hate crimes were down 30% in 2022. And this was from the FBI. So last year, when we had this orgy of people bashing us over the head with stop Asian hate, there was just this tsunami of racist propaganda trying to make black people the face of anti-Asian violence. And the FBI stats show that anti-Asian violence was actually down last year from what it had been in 2021. But you wouldn't have known that by listening to the white media. And that's not because hate crimes in general are down. In fact, as CNN had to admit, although hate crimes against Asians have fallen by one third, hate crimes in general are actually up, not down. There's more hate crimes now than there were in 2021 or even last year. And it's black Americans who are the majority of the victims, 52%. The FBI's 2022 crime stats, which represent the latest year that data is available, was posted a couple of days ago. And when you look at the 2022 hate crimes report, you see that black people are the number one victims of hate crimes in America. Not Asians, not Jews or anyone else. Black people. And it's always been this way. See, with other groups, they have one incident happen to them and the white media goes into a fury saying that they're the number one targeted group in America. Meanwhile, the FBI puts out the stats and no, it's still black people who are the number one victims. We're the number one targets of hate crimes in America. Jews come in a distant, distant second, not even a third the number of black hate crimes victims. As for Asians, they're number eight on the list. They're not the top targets or even the second most targets or third or fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh, but eight. So no matter what the white media says today or last year, it's black people who we ought to be talking about. But the white media are participants in our oppression. They run interference for these hate criminals and justify their anti-black violence. So of course, they're not going to be talking about who the main victims of hate crimes are. They're going to say, let's talk about something else. Where is the anti-black hate crime law at? Where is anyone even talking about it? The congressional black talkers have been constantly giving their idea for what they think the legislative priority should be. And they're talking about abortion and immigration. We have to stop letting the white media get away with downplaying and dismissing how we're targeted. When they falsely claim that other groups are the most targeted groups in America, that's meant as a way to spread the falsehood that black people aren't being targeted at all. And then when the latest act of anti-black violence occurs yet again, we'll have people telling us that nobody's targeting black people. And they get that talking point from these white media stories. That's where that misimpression is originated and pushed from. Because on the rare occasion when they do talk about some black person who was harmed, they always make sure to shoehorn everybody else into the conversation. They start off talking about black people and then it becomes black and brown or black and Asian or minorities or what have you. So this is why we shouldn't get involved in this. When they try to drag us into it, they're doing what they always do, using us as footballs in their games of power politics. You want to talk about hate crimes? Then you need to talk about black people, not talk around us.
And in somewhat related news, in an example of how countries outside the U.S. are treating non-black Americans, the government of El Salvador has enacted a measure where passengers from African countries have to pay a $1,000 fee in order to fly into El Salvador. The El Salvadoran government says the money will be used to make improvements to their international airport. Now, if you know anything about how corrupt those banana republics are down there, you know that none of that money is going to make it to any airport. It's going to go straight into the pockets of the president and the rest of those crooks down there. But hey, that's their cover story and they're sticking to it. And it says a lot that they think that there will be so many Africans who will still be willing to pay this exorbitant fee that they'll be able to repair and upgrade their airport. That's millions and millions of dollars that they seem to be anticipating is going to come rushing towards them. Now, before anyone tries to claim that this is a black tax, it's not necessarily, because it only applies to people carrying African passports. The El Salvadorans, like a number of other countries, don't want their country being used as a transit point for people who are trying to mass migrate to the United States. You see, all of these migrant caravans and all of these people, bums rushing the U.S. border, was inevitably going to bring about a backlash. All of these people transiting through these nations, it was inevitably going to have people from other countries saying, we don't want this going on anymore. And given how so many of these countries are European or have cultures and histories of anti-black racism, it was predictable that they would bar black people first. Now, it's usually at this point that you might have one of us saying, well, gee, if the Africans are having a hard time getting into El Salvador or any of these other countries, maybe they should go ahead and tell them about how hard working they are. Tell them that they're much harder working than those lazy black Americans up north. Oh, they're not like those lazy black Americans. They're educated. They're hard working. Oh, they don't bring those kind of problems. Maybe they should try that. See if it convinces anyone. Black Americans don't have anything to worry about on this front because we have a well-earned reputation for not doing these kind of things. You go to Japan or Scandinavia or wherever and black Americans are actually welcomed, more or less. All around the world, whenever a black person shows up in one of these foreign countries, the locals will try to talk to them about Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, or even Barack Obama. Yuck. When we show up, they know we're not there to run any scams or to try to illegally immigrate or to pinch off of their system or what have you. When they think about black culture, they think of what black Americans, specifically those of us who came out of slavery in the U.S., contributed to the world. They admire it. We've made our name worldwide, and it's a good one. Now, of course, being black means you got to watch your back no matter where you're from or where you're going. But by and large, the main times that we seem to run into trouble traveling while black is when these people in foreign countries mistake us for being Africans or Haitian citizens. Go to Japan and you'll hear people complaining about Nigerian scammers. Go to Europe and they start complaining about Somalians, claiming the Somalians have these little gangs running around. See, that's what happened to those black tourists earlier this year in Mexico. They got carjacked and one of them killed because one of the Mexican cartels thought that these black American tourists were Haitians. And apparently the Mexican cartels are beefing with the Haitians. The gang warfare that we see in places like Haiti and Jamaica is also brought with them to these other countries, too. We've certainly seen it in the United States with groups like the Shawa Posse and others. This is why it's so important to make sure we draw a distinction between ourselves and black immigrants so that we maintain our good reputation. We don't want the things any other group does to be pinned on us. Because that's what happens when a black immigrant does something meritorious or otherwise gets some good press. They make sure to distance themselves from us. They're quick to say that they're Jamaican or Haitian or Nigerian or Kenyan or Cape Verdean, anything but black American. But then if one of them happens to commit a crime or otherwise gets some sort of bad rap pinned on them, they fall silent and suddenly, well, it's black America. It's a black person. And that gets pinned on all of us. So we're going to dispel the confusion. And since all those Latin American countries have traditions and current practices of anti-black racism, I'm pretty sure this thing in El Salvador will only be the beginning. Down there, they think that they're white as it is, and they don't want black people in their countries to begin with. This just gives them the perfect cover to do something they've been wanting to do anyway. Mexico has already began requiring that people whose countries require a visa for them to stay in Mexico now have to get a visa just to go through the airport, even if they're not staying in Mexico, even if they're only going through Mexico for a connecting flight. You know, for all of this effort that the Africans are putting into fleeing, they could have easily put that same money and effort into raising up their own forces and change the conditions of their home countries. You can either accept that reality and get to work preparing to get free at home, or try to run.
But these days, they're running into a door slammed in their faces. Regardless, as black Americans, we're not putting on the cape for anyone. We've got more than enough problems of our own to handle without trying to do things for folks who disrespect and mistreat us, be it in the Middle East or here at home. And as they're finding out, when we're not speaking up for them, when we're not playing peacemaker, their problems tend to be a hell of a lot worse. Good day and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Mouse, Dean Ballantyne, Storm, Wendell, and Brandon Cherry. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black empowerment only exists because of you.